Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into God's word. Father, we thank you. We praise you. You are the king of glory. You're the king of the universe. And we love you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. We're gathered here today on Independence Weekend, and we have the freedom to worship here in our country, and we are forever grateful for that, Lord. I thank you for the many who took advantage of that opportunity and gathered together in this place today to glorify the name of Jesus. As we, as we examine scripture today, we see some who loved you and others who didn't, but Lord, we see that outpouring of the Holy Spirit touching the, the, those who you promised that you would just touch, and many of them are in this room today, and we thank you in advance for what you want to do during the course of this message, so continue to work on our hearts and our minds. Call those of us who need to repent to repent. Call those of us who need to engage to engage. Lord, do that which only you could do today in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So scripture today is going to really conclude with a section where it's just awesome, where Jesus talks about bringing us streams of living water. So we live in Florida. It's been hot lately. How many of you at some point in your life, you've ever been dehydrated? Has anybody ever been dehydrated here? Um, I mean, I've, as I get older, for whatever reason, I get dehydrated much easier than I used to. So those of you who are participating tomorrow in this outreach that we have, you guys are actually getting off quite easy because when we first started the church nine years ago, I was younger, I had more energy, and we would go from eight in the morning till the fireworks went off at night. I mean, we would be out there at the town of Orange Park, we'd set up a booth early, we'd stay out there the entire day, and I mean, all the way until pack out after the fireworks went off. We were doing everything we could to reach people for Jesus. And then about five years ago, I got old in Jesus' name. <laughs> About one o'clock that afternoon, I fell out, man. I was I literally like passed out from dehydration. They had to put me in a car. They had to drive me back to the house. I had a headache. I was throwing up. I had to drink Gatorade and Pedialyte and everything that I could drink. Just I thought I was going to die that day. And uh, finally, after some air conditioning and some liquids, I was able to make it back up there in the evening. So now we just do these flash mob style outreaches. I mean, an hour in and out. Come on, Jesus. Nobody falling out. So you're getting off easy tomorrow so there's no excuse for you not showing up and being a part of that so we certainly hope to see you out there tomorrow but I say that in the context of setting you up for today's message and understanding that the people he's about to speak this to are a desert people right they they live in a desert area they understand what it means to be dehydrated they understand what it means to need water and what a precious commodity it is in a place like they're living so he really hones in perfectly with with the words that he's going to share on the audience that's there before him that day. So we know the buildup of this. We're coming off the scene of the feeding of the 5,000. He's using analogies that are very natural to us. And that he talked about being the bread of life. He's using these analogies of bread and water, something that we could all relate to. And as we open up this set of scriptures, it doesn't start too well. But let me tell you, by the end of our scriptures today, it ends really well for those of us who would believe. So let's dive right into scriptures and get right at it. John 7, 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, and his brothers said to them, they did this rather mockingly, leave here and go to Judea, Jesus, that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. So they're like, you're wanting to get this stage for yourself. His brothers themselves are actually mocking him, and they're, they're chiding him on and they're saying like yeah if you could do a miracle go do it Jesus if you do these things show yourself to the world for not even his brothers believed in him and Jesus said to them my time has not yet come but your time is always here the world cannot hate you but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil you go up to the feast I am not going to this feast for my time has not fully come after saying this he remained in Galilee. So he sends his brothers off. His very brothers are mocking him. His very brothers are chiding him. They don't even believe in his message yet. 
He's saying, my time has not yet come, but soon thereafter, his time would come in a very public way. In fact, in the very last day of this feast where he's sending his brothers, he's going to do something that makes it very clear that he is who he says he is, and he's about to tell the world that he is the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. We see here that the Jewish religious leaders were wanting to kill him. His brothers were egging him on. Why do they want to kill him? Because he's testifying that the world's works are evil. He's standing for uncompromising truth in a world that was evil. Do you think it's just as evil today as it was back then? Yes, I mean, we live in crazy days. We live in crazy times where right is wrong and wrong is right, do we not? I was, I was studying these scriptures in light of what we were reading recently um, in, in the previous set of scriptures and in, in the news and the current events of today. And if you'll recall the scene that kind of begins to set this up, the, the people were crying out for a political savior. They were about to take him by force to make him an earthly king, right? Earlier we sung about him as the king of heaven and earth, that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. But they were looking for a political solution to a spiritual problem. If you go back even further in history, didn't the Jewish people also cry out for an earthly king? And during those years, they got some good kings who followed after God, and they got some bad kings who didn't follow after God. It seems here in America, we're stuck in the same problem. Every four years, we cry out for a king, do we not? Will you save us politically? Let me tell you, our hope is not in either political party. Our hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? That's where our hope should lie. He is the one who could set all these things right. But when you begin to look at the days in which we're in, if you stand for uncompromising truth, the devil will come against you because he wants to kill you, right? And people, when you stand for truth, I'm telling you, weird stuff begins to happen. I'm about to show you an image. It is not political. I don't want you to perceive this through political eyes. I want you to perceive it through the eyes of the devil and what he wants to do to us as Christians. This was actually posted on Facebook. It infuriated me when I saw it, and I wanted to share it with you today. If you're the one who posted it, you have issues. We love you. We'll pray for you. It says this. America's first family, first to be scandal-free in 30 years, no drunken children, totally wholesome family, hated capital words by most white Christians because of the color of their skin, not because of the content of their character. I want to hone in on this sentence right here. Hated by most white Christians because of the color of their skin. Is that complete insanity? They're not making a political remark here. They're not even making a racial remark, to be completely honest with you. What they're doing is hating on Christians. The devil is behind statements like this. This is what he wants to do is twist words. If you're part of this church, man, I'm here to tell you, if you were here last week, I hope you heard our heart for multiculturalism. I mean, we love people. We love people of all backgrounds. I hope no Christian in this room is defined by that crazy sentence there. Can I get an amen? I mean, but how insane is that? Think about the way that they twist words. You're welcome to take it down, but think about the way that they twist words to try to get people to hate people. We need to walk the walk in love and peace and freedom, sharing the gospel with love, seasoned with love, but calling people to righteousness and repentance by first and foremost, living the holy life ourselves. The only way we could do that is by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We can't do that apart from him, can we not? And the beautiful part, as we conclude scripture later today, is God will empower us by the Holy Spirit to live this out. Let me tell you something. We'll, we'll get off the, the high horse for a second. Have you ever noticed how divided our country is right now? Like there's 50% on one side of every issue and 50% on the other side of the issue? Let me tell you something. You could post all you want about whatever it is you think from gun rights to political rights to this rights to that right. You ain't going to move nobody. Your views and the other people's views are polar opposite because the only thing that's going to change a person's heart is the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's who we rely on, that God would empower us by the Holy Spirit to change hearts for all eternity. That's the only thing that's truly going to make a difference. Can I get an amen and an amen, especially now that I've completely lost myself in the message? Lord, would you help me get back to where I need to be? 
But here's something I've noticed in that same kind of a vein. Oftentimes, the most vocal people living in sinful lifestyles, whatever that might be, are the ones who also want to shut down Christian speech, like you saw up there. For whatever reason, it's strange like that. They talk about tolerance. They talk about everybody loving one another, but they love everybody until someone comes out with a Christian word out of their mouth, right? We need the Holy Spirit. He is our victory. So the same thing that we're seeing today is nothing new. The Jews did it when they were out there crying out for a king. They were doing it in Jesus' generation. We see it in our own. The only hope we have is for the King of kings and Lord of lords to come and make all things right and new. Amen? But here's a question that I would have for you. So we as believers who lovingly live like Jesus, guess what? We can expect persecution. You can expect persecution. If you're never being persecuted, you have to wonder if you're living enough like Jesus because isn't that what he got? He even kind of hinted to his brothers, you're not going to get the same problems I have because I'm the one that's lovingly calling out evil and saying what's truth and what's not. So if you're never getting called out, you know, are you bold enough for him? Lord, would you embolden us to live like you John 7, 10. But after this, his brothers had gone up to the feast, and then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. He was listening to what they were saying. The Jews were looking for him and at the feast and saying, where is he? And much muttering was going on about him by the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, no, he's leading people astray. Yet for the fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. See how they were shutting down speech even in that day. And who was doing it? The religious people in his time where the religious political leaders were shutting down the speech. I want to talk about this feast for a moment because it's vitally important to the story, which represents one of the shining moments of Jesus' life and divinity here on earth. Um, He's about to go public in a very big way. Pastor Avi was here and actually shared with us one day uh, the history behind the feast, and I'll do my very best to communicate it as a non-Jewish person, but to the Jewish person, this was one of the high holy days. It was one of the biggest feasts of the year. It was a time where they were celebrating the harvest. The harvest was coming in. They had just trusted God for the provision that had been afforded them to that moment, and every male Jew for 20 miles around was required to be in attendance at this particular feast where they remembered that at one time they were in the wilderness and God guided them through that. They were celebrating how he provided for them while they were in the wilderness and they were celebrating that he had just provided for them in that particular moment. The, the tents, they would, it, would, it would become a tent city surrounding Jerusalem. They would have specific uh, things surrounding the way that the tents would be. The walls of the tents had to be rather thin so that light could shine through them just enough. The open roofs had to be there so that they could gaze upon the stars at night. They had tents that were everywhere. Even if they lived in a normal um, house type of a setting where they had a roof, they would go outside. They would put the tents even on the roofs of their house because they wanted to remember the time that they were in the wilderness and what God had done for them. So as the feast goes on, day after day, the priest would call them out and they would begin to celebrate. Celebrate, And they would pick up citrus fruits in one hand and palm fronds in another. And they would go through a processional that was traveling through the streets of Jerusalem that would conclude at the temple where the priest would pour out water on the altar as the highlight of it. So why did they do that? We live in a dry parched land there in Israel. And they are literally saying as an act of worship that they are pouring out the very water which gives life to them. They're pouring it out and they're saying, God, we trust that this valuable resource that you've entrusted us to, we're going to give it away to keep it. We're going to pour it out on the altar as an act of love and worship unto you. And God, all our water is gone. You are going to need to provide for us for next year. So they're saying, Lord, we trust you. It's in this setting that these next scriptures are going to begin to take place and take shape. So as they're going up, this is the words that they're chanting as they get to the kind of crescendo of this feast. Isaiah 12, 3, with joy, you will draw the water of the wells of salvation. With joy, you will draw from the water of the wells of salvation. So who is salvation ultimately found in? Jesus, right? So just keep these in your mind as we begin to conclude in just a minute. 
So they're literally pouring out that water, representing their trust in God to supply for next year's provision. The brothers go into Jerusalem. Jesus makes his way there in private. He's listening to what's going on. He's about to enter the temple and he's beginning to preach. John 7, 14. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? He studied at the feet of God the Father. He's the author of Scripture. So they're blown away because he didn't study under them. So Jesus answers them, my teaching is not mine, but it is him or it is his who sent me. He's starting to claim his deity. He's starting to claim who he is. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answers them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that, not that it is from Moses, but it is from the fathers. And you circumcise man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment." So they're nitpicking, and he knows it. He's telling them who he is. They're beginning to get angry. They already want to kill him in a moment. They're really going to want to kill him for what he's about to say. He's there in the temple. He's preaching. All these ceremonies are going on all around. He's yet to really publicly reveal who he is to the masses, but he's about to get ready to do so. I love the fact that some are astonished in a good way, but sadly, in this case, the majority who were there are not astonished by his teaching. They go about their everyday lives. They're not listening to what he has to say, and we suffer from that in our own generation, do we not? But yet some wonder, as I hope you do today, could this be the Christ? John 7, 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said... Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and yet they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this man is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I have come from him, and he sent me. They were seeking to arrest him, but nobody laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, When Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? So there's those who are inquiring. There's those that are here like you. They're saying, is Jesus who he says he is? Many of you, thank God, have been convinced that he is who he says he is. But some of you might hear, be here today and you're seeking, you're wondering, are these claims true? Hopefully God is working on your heart, reaffirming to you that he is who he says he is. And our greatest hope would be that you would surrender your life to him as your Lord and Savior. So those are questioning. There are those who are skeptics that are there. And he's about to really offend them with those words that he shared. He said, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. So for the religious people who were in that room, he's standing in the temple. For them, the words that he's speaking is blasphemy. He's in the very temple of the living God claiming that it is God who sent him. And they're offended. They want to kill him. They want nothing to do with him. The spirit of antichrist is welling up in their heart. These are religious people who are supposed to love, people who are supposed to make a difference, people who are supposed to want to see people get saved, people who would rejoice when people are getting healed, not look for any critique oh he healed on the sabbath so we can't we can't have that they were hypocrites and he was lovingly calling them out by telling them who he was yet they didn't have ears to hear lord would you give us ears to hear they want him arrested the pharisees heard from the crowd muttering these things about them the chief priests and pharisees sent officers to arrest them Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer than I'm going to go to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. 
And the Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me? Where, am, where I am, you cannot come. This is the point that I make about if you try to talk to somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit and you have different viewpoints, you are speaking to a brick wall. I mean, you can go out there, be it politics, any of these other issues that might be some of the issues of our day. You are speaking to a brick wall. They're answering a spiritual response with a natural one. They're going and they're saying, oh, where's he going to go? Is he going to go hang out with the Greeks? We have the um, opportunity to have some hindsight, right? We know that what he's really saying is that one day these same people would crucify him on a cross and that they would try to bring him to an earthly death of which they were successful. But we also know that what he's really speaking of is the very fact that he would rise again, that he would go to heaven and be seated at the right hand of God the Father, that he would be the real king of the universe. And he's waiting there, and one day he will come back, not this time with grace, but this time to judge the world on sin and righteousness. And we hope that those who are here find themselves in him that they love Jesus with all their heart, strength, soul, and mind, and they, they follow hard after him, and that we would be a people who live on mission, telling the world about who he is, and know that sometimes persecution will come against us because we're living like Jesus. But we don't debate endless numerologies. We don't debate endless politics. We don't debate stupid things that are not going to change anybody's mind. We're here to live for the King of kings and Lord of lords, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he promises us that the Holy Spirit will be with us. He closes with an offer that anyone would be crazy to refuse, and I pray that if you're here today, you do not refuse his offer. John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, see all these feast days, there's this big buildup, it all comes to a culmination. On the last day, the great day, Jesus stood up and cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So let's give a little bit of a context, uh, context so that you could see just how amazing this particular moment was. Remember when the scripture opens up, he's like, my time has not yet come. This is his public outing. And what do I mean by that? Let's go back to the scene. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. Every male Jew for 20 miles is required to be in attendance. The Super Bowl moment, the crescendo, is the last day, the great day of the feast where all of the people who are in attendance are gathered together and they're doing exactly that which they did on the previous days, but it is the maximum attendance moment. Everybody is present at that moment. So they're going and they're marching through a processional. They have the palms in their one hand. They have the fruit as an offering. They're celebrating, they're singing, salvation from Isaiah, right? From Isaiah, drink from the waters of salvation from Isaiah that we read a little bit earlier. It all comes to this moment. The priest grabs the water. He goes up to the altar and he's getting ready to pour it out and a hush falls over the entire crowd. And that very moment on that peak day with all of Jerusalem watching, he cries out in a loud voice. It says, he cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. To this group that understood what it meant to live in a dry, parched land called Florida, come on, Jesus, to this group that understood exactly what he's talking about at that epic moment when the priest is about to pour out that water, trusting in God, he cries out and declares himself to be God. This is his crowning moment where he's revealing to the world who he was. And I hope today you're getting that, that it emboldens you, that it excites you, that it gets you fired up, that you are a believer in Jesus Christ and that the Holy Spirit indwells your heart and indwells your mind and calls you to go out and live for him with everything that is within you. <laughs> Jeremiah brings us a bit of soberness when it comes to this topic, he interlinks it with what's going on from the Old Testament. Jeremiah 2.13. My people, he's speaking to believers, 
have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what do I mean by that? He's speaking to an audience that believes at that moment. This is an Old Testament scripture that's prophetic of what we're seeing going on with Jesus. What were the people doing in Old Testament times rather than seeking God? They were seeking out cisterns for themselves. They were finding salvation in things that were apart from God. They were finding salvation in bedrooms that they shouldn't be in. They were finding salvation in money. They were finding salvation in their jobs. They were finding salvation through entertainment. They were finding salvation through recreation. They were finding salvation through a multitude of different things that always end in a dry, dark place when they're done apart from God's purposes and plans. Don't we do the same? Even as believers, we often go look for and try to find happiness and joy and contentment in things that are far from God. And what he's saying is that's a great evil that we are supposed to lovingly call each other out when we see that happening. That we should find salvation in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. And that we should live a life where we share what God has done with everyone we encounter. You see, when rivers of living water flow and they stop, guess what? That water begins to get rather stale really quick, does it not? It becomes useless, and then we feel that um, it becomes polluted, right? So some of you might even be here today, and you're not living a life that we talked about earlier, where as a believer you're giving it away to keep it. You're not going out there and making a difference. You're not serving. You're not giving. For whatever reason, your Christianity has become stale and routine. You may have even come here out of obligation this morning, but there's no joy in your walk. Jesus is saying that you should have joy in your walk. And one of the ways that happens is when we give it away to keep it. When we let those rivers flow through us and flow into others, we get to experience the joy of seeing them too come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you're stale, let this message rock you. Let this message get you fired up. Let this message reignite your heart and your spirit to go out there and live a life where you're telling people about what God has done for you. Psalms 42, one, would he give us this kind of spirit? As a deer pants for flowing streams, or maybe as the old King James says, as a deer panteth for the water, oh, my soul longeth after you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, O God, for the living God. Out of this heart will flow rivers of living water. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Thank you, Lord, for that living water. Lord, I only pray that I did your word justice today. I only pray, Holy Spirit, that you you got through. I know you did to my own self and helped me this morning. I pray that you touched many others as well. Father, for those of us who are believers that might find ourselves trapped in sin or finding our hope in cisterns that we know are running dry, Lord, we pray that today would be a day that you would strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we could lay those things aside and that we could follow hard after you. We repent. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for the hope that is found in you and you alone. Father, never let our relationship with you transcend into the cold, dead religion that the Jews found themselves in that day where one point they might have loved you and then soon thereafter they're calling out to crucify you. Lord, may that never happen in our watch. Lord, would you give us that kind of spirit that would desire to live on mission? We've laid out even things before our congregation for this very month. Would we live it out with the hope that we would see the next generation come to know you, O God? But as we stand here today, I stand maybe as Jesus did on that fateful day. He is the one who brings rivers of living water. Are you experiencing that today? Is that part of your life? Or do you need that? Are you in a dry, parched place today? This moment is for you. Maybe today's a day where you need to surrender your life to Jesus for the very first time. And while we don't believe one can lose their salvation, maybe you're at a place where you really haven't been walking with him, and today's a day that you need to come home. The Holy Spirit's still talking to you. The Holy Spirit's drawing you. The Holy Spirit's still wooing you back into his presence with the hope that you would just be reignited or ignited for the first time in your faith. 
If that's you, I'd love to pray for you. We won't do anything to embarrass you, I promise you. But if you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ today, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up high so I could see it? I'd love to pray for you right where you're at. Is there anybody here today? I see your hand, sir, and your hand and yours and yours. Thank you, Lord, for those who have raised their hands in this place today. We pray with them as we exalt you and together we say, Jesus, you're the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. Father, let us never forget it. Father, we rejoice today in you. We are no longer skeptics. We are sold out followers of you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for changing our heart. Thank you for changing our mind. Thank you for setting us on the path of righteousness when we once sought out a path of sin. Father, you're the only one who could really change hearts and minds. And today we thank you for your presence in our life by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask for forgiveness for our many sins, for our many evils. Lord, we lay them at your feet and we willingly and lovingly accept the forgiveness that comes from a relationship with you. Father, knowing all these things, would you restore unto us the joy of our salvation or give it to us for the very first time? If you raised your hand, I want to encourage you after the service, come on up and say hello or go to our next step station. We have people that would love to give you some next steps to begin your walk of faith with Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, I just pray that you would live for him. Join us tomorrow morning. Let's go out there and make a difference. Let's see our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the fourth. God bless you.